Hi. So, building kilns requires quite a lot of information, which is why I've split these videos up into parts, because basically it's too much information for one video. The video would be like an hour long or something, and, and people just wouldn't watch it because that's the way people are. Now, the information you need is really useful because it doesn't only help you build a kiln, it'll help you recondition kilns as well. Now, as long as the fire brick in a kiln is in good condition and the case of the kiln is in reasonable condition, you don't need to worry about the electrics contained within the kiln. All of those can be replaced and replaced cheaply. I'm going to take you next door. It's a bit echoey, so please forgive me on that. And then we'll come back in here. But I want to show you the kiln that I bought. Okay, please forgive the sound quality. It does echo in here. This is my kiln. Now, I paid 150 quid for this, and I bought it because the bricks in there are rated to 1600 degrees, and they were in perfect condition. Everything else was shot to hell. So I had to replace all of these coils. Now, if you're going to use a kiln for a while, you're going to be replacing the coils. So learning how to make coils is a really valuable thing to have to maintain your kiln. Once you've made the kiln, you're going to have to maintain it at some stage. Unless you want to pay a maintenance fee, you're going to need to know how to make coils. So, making and fitting the coils is a key thing in building, reconditioning, repairing or maintaining your kiln. Again, sorry for the poor quality of both the sound and the image here, but this kiln's a bit heavy. Here is a view of the back of the kiln. The coils all come out and then join up with the solid state relays there. Those solid state relays are controlled by the PID controller. That is essentially all of the electronics your kiln contains. Incidentally, the reason I'm doing it this way is because I'm working on the assumption that you don't have a welder. If you have a welder and can weld, awesome, weld everything. But not everybody has, and this can be made with hand tools, and that's what I like about it. Now the reason we're concentrating on coils and the electrics here is because, like I say, it opens up so many more doors to you. The easiest, quickest, cheapest route, believe it or not, the kiln ownership, is to buy an old one. You find an old one, bricks are in good condition, cases in good condition, and you know your electrics, that's going to be the cheapest way of getting kiln ownership for a decent kiln. I enjoy building things, and I know lots of people enjoy building things, and there's a sense of pride in that, so we're building it. But like I say, we're splitting it into parts so that we can review the certain sections, and this one really is going to be about the electrics, obviously. We'll do a third part where I finish this, but to be honest, the third part is all cosmetic stuff. It's, it's just stuff I think is interesting to look at and to finish the kiln. And actually, the other thing we've done is put these uprights here, because that's where the door's going to hang. So, when we're thinking about the electrics, the essential bit you're going to buy is this. It's the resistance wire. Now, this comes in a whole range of gauges, and it always says on it what the resistance is. And this particular one is 1.2 millimetres, and it's 1.72 ohms per metre. I choose that because I find it the most convenient. It just makes coils that are very adaptable to medium to large kilns and I tend to use this material quite a lot because I find it a good grade of wire to be using. Now <clears throat> all wire gets hot obviously it's a heating element and because it's hot it spalls it flakes it's stressed they do eventually break so to just to reiterate knowing about your coils it really is an essential thing I think. Now we're going to plug this into a main supply, and there are two main supplies we've got, really, that's 230 volts, 110 volts, uh, and it's going to have an effect. Now a main supply is an AC circuit, and what you usually measure with AC is something called the impedance. The impedance is the resistance plus the reactance. Now impedance only have an, has an effect if the circuit has reactance, and the only things that have reactance are capacitors and inductors. So if you've got a capacitor or an inductor in your circuit, then you need to pay attention to the impedance. Here, we're using coils, which are pure resistance. There is no reactance in a coil, in, in a heating coil. It's just a big gold resistor, that's all it is. So we can ignore the reactance, and we can just use Ohm's Law. 
That makes everything super, super easy for us because it's volts equals current times resistance. So we want to work everything out. That's what we use. And it's V equals IR. V is volts, I is current, R is resistance. Because we need to know how big to make those coils. Now, if we're going to plug this thing in, and we plug it in into a UK supply at 230 volts, and we've got a 13 amp fuse on the end of the plug, there are limits. We know we're only going to be able to draw 13 amps. We know it's going to be at 230 volts. So we'll know from V equals IR what the resistance has to be. If you calculate that, you'll find it somewhere around about 18 ohms or so. With this, we know this is 1.72 ohms a meter. So if we divide 18 with 1.72, it gives us a number of meters of this we need. So if we cut off 10.5 meters or so of this stuff, it will have a resistance of 18 ohms. If we plug it into a 230 volt supply, it will draw 13 amps. It's that simple. As long as we keep that relationship, we know what it is that it's going to be. Now, if we want to know the watts, which is volts times amps, it's going to be about three kilowatts or something like that. That's quite a lot for this. It's three kilowatts, about the same as your kettle or a normal heater. So you've got tons of safety of margin. We're going to put lots of insulation. We're not really too worried about the ramp up time. It doesn't need to be massively quick. So we can bang on a few feet of mm, resistance as a safety margin against the fuse blowing. So if I cut off 12 feet of that, of this, sorry, 12 meters of this stuff, I'm going to have plenty of resistance to keep my amp draw below 13 amps, in which case the plug that I use is not going to blow its fuse, it's just going to be Jim Dandy and happy. Now I don't obviously necessarily need to plug this in via a normal socket, I could wire it in through a cooker socket or through a shower socket and use the appropriate gauge wire. That's a lot of trouble to go to, really I just want to put a plug on it. But I could do that, in which case I can go up to 36, 40 amps, whatever it is. And on 2.5 mil I could do 32 amps if I wired it straight into the board. Don't plan on doing that, but I could do, in which case that amp draw would change the resistance that I need to put in there. Now because a lot of countries have a 110 volt, clearly that's going to have an effect because it's V equals IR. If you've got a 110 volt supply and a 13 amp limit on it, then you're going to need about 13 ohms instead of 18 ohms and it'll go down to around about one and a half kilowatts, which is going to be ample really. So it's really easy to make this stuff using V equal IR and V times A to get your kilowatt drawer on it. It's dead simple. In order to get that resistance, all we have to do is cut the right length of this wire off. That's all we have to do. And we can wind that up. Now, we've got two sides to this. So there's a coil on that side and a coil on that side. And we're going to bring out the back and we're going to connect them. There are two ways of connecting it. We connect end to end, in which case they're series, so we have an end, our coil, an end, connected to the other end, our coil, and then going out. That's an in-series connection. And if we do that, and we connect our supply to the two ends of those coils, then that resistance in series is, adds up. Now we're quite lucky because this is a really quite a small device, so we can just add them up in series. So if we get two six meter lengths and add them, it's equivalent to one 12 meter length, which is exactly the resistance that we want. Now you do have an option, obviously, you could connect the two coils in parallel. So you have two wires, one live, one neutral, and they go to two separate coils. That's in parallel. What happens when you connect uh, resistors in parallel is the resistance always goes down. Resistors in series, you just add the um, resistances. Resistances in parallel, you add the reciprocal, that is one over the resistance, and then take the reciprocal of that to give you what your resistors in parallel actually are. Dead simple, just scan on um, Google, find out what the formula is, plug it in and you'll get your resistors in parallel. Resistance in parallel, obviously, you need to make sure that your total resistance of your coils as they're connected still follow the V equals IR rule to make sure that you don't draw the more amps than your supply can supply you. Because if I do resistances in parallel of 2 at 9 ohms, the overall resistance will be 4.5 ohms, half. So instead of drawing 13 amps, it will attempt to draw 26 amps twice. 
and that will blow your fuse. So it's easy to do it in series, just add them together. On a device like this, there's no real challenge. On bigger kilns, you do a resistance in series and parallel, but then you're much more likely to have wired a bigger kiln into its own socket. My kiln, for instance, there is on 6mm cable. It's a resistance in series and parallel combination, but it's a 12 kilowatt cable heat <laughs> kiln, as it needs to be being such a big kiln. This one, tiny kiln. So that's a lot of information about how to calculate these coils. But it really just comes down to knowing what your resistance needs to be to limit your amp draw given your voltage supply. That's all there is to it. Once you know that, then you just cut yourself off a length and wind it in a coil. Now, coil winding, I actually really enjoy, and it is a piece of cake. Okay, so this is how I wind coils. I use this little mini lathe to do it. Now, you don't need a lathe to do it. You can do this by hand, or you can do it with a drill where the drill's fixed down. It's a little bit more tedious, but it's the same principle. What I've got in the lathe is a bar, and it's 1.2 millimeters. Remember, we cut that channel at 1.5, so you choose your bar to make your end coil to fit the channel that you just cut, and it's basically just a little bit bigger. So I've got 1.2 here. I'll wind this quite tightly. When it's wound, we undo it, and it springs out a little bit, and it will fit beautifully into 1.5 mil. All you do is put a bit of tension on the wire, and then turn it on. And it takes no time at all to make a beautiful tight coil. So I'm going to finish this coil. Again, there's the coil finished. It's surprising, isn't it, how six meters shrinks down to so little. So with that, that is actually the finished coil. Now it is touching and we need to stretch it out. But that's the finished coil. Incidentally, I always leave my chuck key in here. And I get told off by it uh, quite a lot. The reason I leave it in here is there's in fact a safety switch where you can't turn it on if the chuck key is in. That chuck key's got to be removed to turn this machine on. So you shouldn't leave your chuck in the chuck, a chuck key in the chuck, general is a general rule, perfectly true. But at this specific instance, it's got a safety switch in it preventing it starting if that's in. It's the safest place for it. Okay, so there's our coil. Now, I've measured the size of that channel that we cut, and it turns out it's 45 centimetres. So I need to stretch this coil out to 45 centimetres. But you'll see what I'm doing as I talk. I also need a bit that's going to go through those holes that we drilled, if you remember those holes, because I need the coil to get into the back so I can connect it. So I un unwind about that much. Again, we've put plenty of um, leeway into this, incidentally. We don't need to be too worried about all of this stuff because we've got 12 meters when we need a 10 and a half. So plenty of leeway that we're not going to stress it out in terms of its draw. So we just unwind a bit of that. That's gonna be more than enough. And I've positioned this, so this bit and this bit are 45 centimetres apart. So if I put that there and stretch that, I'm stretching the coil. Now obviously it'll spring back, because it's a spring. So what we need to do is stretch it beyond that, and you'll feel it as it stretches, giving. You can just feel it relaxing. It will spring back, and you'll go back to the relaxation stage, and you can see where you are. And you need to stretch it out, so that when it springs back, it finishes where your mark is, because that now is a really nice finished coil. Then all we have to do is feed it in the channel. So I'll give you a close-up of feeding it in the channel. Okay, so there's the channel we're going to feed it into, and if you remember earlier, we've drilled those holes in. You put one wire into the hole, pull it out, lay your other wire in, hook your other wire into the other hole. And then we put the coil into the channel that we just made. And there we go, fits rather nicely. Okay, we're at the back of the kiln now where we've poked the coils through and you see these are joined by that brass connector. So that's the top of the two coils joined by that connector, which I get from this stuff. 
I just chopped them out. Now they've been in that big kiln for about two years now, something like that, no problem at all. So they form a nice junction that'll connect the coils. And you'll see that the end of the coils I've terminated with the same brass connector, because that's where my supply wires come in. My neutral from the supply goes straight into one end, and then the other end goes into this thing, which is a solid state relay. And the solid state relay is in fact just a switch. So the live supply goes in one side, and then the live supply comes out of the other side and into the other coil. Remember, the neutral goes in this side. And it doesn't matter which way around, one or two. This is rated for um, 24 volts to 380 volts of VAC. 40 amps, gonna do just Jim Dandy. You saw these actually in the uh, bigger kiln where each of my coil sets is controlled by one of them. Now on this side is where the PID controller comes and that sends the on off signal. So that's only three to 32 volts. So anywhere between three and 32 volts, we can actually just switch that on and off. And when we do that, it's just like operating a light switch. It switches the live. Now it matters which way around this goes. Three is plus. 4 is minus, and that's a DC input. This takes the AC and switches it. That's all it does. And that's the control electronics at the back of the kiln. Now, we'll connect that up when we uh, do the rest of the connections, but that's the connections for it. And it really is, if you like, as, com as complicated as that. That's how easy wiring uh, kilns gets. Okay, I get a sense it's getting to be a really long video with uh, a bit much information in it, so I'm going to leave it there on this one. So... To recap, what we've done is learned how to make our coils and how to connect them in the back together. We still have to um, put the control electronics in to control those coils, but we'll do that in the next video. Um, we still have to finish the case and we'll do that as well. I'm not quite sure which, one, which way around it will be, but I think that the coil making stuff is really, really important because it opens up so many possibilities particularly grabbing and refurbishing an old kiln. And you are going to need it when it comes to running a kiln anywhere because these things do burn out. But anyway, that's enough of me for a while. I'll get back on with this tomorrow and do an update on it. I hope you enjoyed it so far and thank you very much for watching.